Everyone, um, my name is Christine Sai. I work in product marketing, and I'm very excited to introduce our marketing talks at Google Speaker today, Fred Wilson. Um, a little bit about Fred. As many of you know, he's um, a managing partner at Union Square Ventures. Um, some of their investments include Twitter, Boxy, Adaptive Blue, Meetup, Zynga, Tumblr, and FeedBurner, which I believe Google acquired back in 07, a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, many of you are followers of his blog, avc.com, and if you're not, you should be. Um, I, th I think I followed his blog for a few years now, back when it was on the old um, avc.blogs, the old subdomain. Anyway, so definitely a must read. Um, today, Fred is going to be talking about disruption. More specifically, what are the next disruptive industries? And at the end of the talk, there'll be time for Q&A. Um, for those of you who are VCing in from remote offices or possibly maybe too shy to ask in person here, um, submit your questions on the Dory at go slash Fred Wilson talk. And he'll be including those questions in the Q&A. So without further ado, here's Fred Wilson. Oh, beautiful. All right, thank you. So uh, this is my first time doing a, a talk. Can, can everyone hear me? Do I need this? I should probably do it. Um, so this is my first time doing a talk at Google. I'm really excited to do it. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, some friendly faces in the crowd. And, uh, and uh, I've got a topic that I'm quite interested in, and hopefully you all are interested in as well, which is the internet and how it disrupts industries and what industries are likely to be disrupted next by the internet. Um, before I get into the talk, I wanted to acknowledge um, the readers of my blog um, for helping me uh, put this presentation together. My blog has become, uh, my blog's at abc.com if, if you um, want to check it out. Um, my blog has become you know, part of how I work. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have a pretty vibrant community of people who, who read it and who, who leave a lot of comments on it. And one of the things that I started doing is I started taking the presentations that I give and publishing them, publishing a draft of them on the blog in advance of the talk. And I did that with this one uh, on uh, uh, Monday morning. and. Uh, in, in the span of the past couple days, I've, I've gotten something around like, like 125 or 150 comments, many of them very, very good. And if you, and I, if you look at the original version of this talk that I published, um, which is up on my blog, and then the final version, which I published this morning, um, you'll see that there are a bunch of changes. And there's also a bunch of changes in my brain, which um, you wouldn't see um, because I didn't publish the, what I was thinking about talking about. but uh, in any way, I just wanted to thank the people who participated in that process because in many ways I'm delivering a talk that was collectively produced um, by a bunch of people. And if you really want to go back even further, you can say that many of these ideas are ideas that, that I've been exploring on the blog for five or six years now. And, and my thinking about them has been very much influenced by uh, the community of people who participate there. So uh, that uh, hopefully uh, gives people their, their due. The other thing that I would want, I want to recognize up front is I have a lot of images in this presentation that I pulled um, from Flickr. And um, uh, one of the comments that I got uh, uh, actually on Twitter uh, sometime in the past couple of days was, you know, who do, what does Fred Wilson think uh, stealing all these copyrights? I, I don't know that these images are copyrighted. Um, and if they are, uh, I feel bad for stealing them. But in any case, I have, um, I have uh, given attribution down in the bottom uh, where I took an a, a image from Flickr. Uh, the URL of that image is, is, is attributed. Um, if, if, uh, I hope that's good enough uh, for the people who are criticizing me. So uh, anyway, this, this talks about disruption. And uh, this is something that I think is fundamental to our investment thesis at Union Square Ventures. We look for industries that are being disrupted by the internet. We look to understand the forces at work. And we, and we look to understand where we can profit from that disruption. And I wanted to share with all of you 
uh, the way we think about this, what industries we think are next, and, and hopefully have a discussion. I don't think that I'm going to say much today that comes as a surprise to any of you. And there will be some of you in the crowd that will be thinking, gee, tell me something I don't know. I'm not sure that I can tell people at Google something that, that you don't know. Maybe I can give you a framework for the way we think about it, or maybe give you a clue into the way venture capitalists think. Um, and then we can have a conversation, and you can educate me probably more than I can educate you. So with that, we'll get into it. So my, my thinking is that the media industry, which is the industry that Google operates in and, and the industry that the vast uh, percentage of our portfolio companies industries in, uh, is, is the first industry to be f really fundamentally disrupted uh, by the internet. And there are just some pictures here. Uh, that's Last FM, Neighborhood Radio, which, uh, as you may know, is a radio as a personalized radio station that anybody can listen to that takes advantage of your musical neighbors. So in a sense, people who like music uh, that are similar to the music I like are programming, are peer producing to program a radio station for me. That of course couldn't happen uh, in, in traditional media. I get a better experience listening to neighborhood radio than any radio station uh, that was that's, uh, delivered over the air. The Kindle uh, is my, my latest um, sort of obsession, and I enjoy reading on a Kindle much more than, than, than on a book. Um, Google has done some very interesting things in, in around news, as has the Huffington Post. And this is a screenshot here of um, a service by one of our portfolio companies called Boxy. And for those who don't know, Boxy is a, is a browser that is customized for the TV and the 10-foot experience and aggregates all the streaming services that are delivered over the internet into a point and click interface. And I think Boxy and services like Boxy are gonna do for uh, visual entertainment um, uh, what you know, Firefox and, and other browsers, Chrome, have, have done for textual information. And so I think it's first important to understand, you know, why is the internet disruptive? I had a, I had a stock chart here, um, which was the New York Times company stock price over the past 10 years. And as you might imagine, it sort of a, looks like a, a ski hill, just starts here and goes down. And uh, one of my uh, readers suggested that stocks go up and down for lots of reasons and that something other than a stock chart would be better. And they suggested that I plot uh, Twitter versus the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. This could be Facebook versus the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, or this could be Google versus the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. It doesn't have to be Twitter. But nevertheless, it is, it is interesting that new services have come along using internet technologies and have um, blown past these established brands like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times in terms of the audiences that they've aggregated. And so it's important to understand why that is. And, and for me, probably the single most important point was expressed by my partner, Albert, in a blog post he wrote called Power to the People. The URL is, is there. It's a very long URL. I probably should have shortened it. Um, but what he said is that the internet um, takes power away from large institutions and delivers it to the people. And, uh, and I think that that's the fundamental thing. When we look at businesses, we look at um, what do consumers really want in a business and what are they getting today and what can the internet do to give them what they really want. And, and that is the disruptive potential of the internet at its, at its most fundamental form. But there are some other factors at work. Uh, capital efficiency um, is one. Uh, I, wrote a I wrote a blog post um, uh, late last year uh, saying that, that we had done some analysis and that in 10 years, or eight years actually, um, it cost about one-tenth the amount of hardware, software, bandwidth, storage, and other expenses to build a web service. And that is really before we've seen the effect of things like App Engine and Amazon Web Services and other cloud computing platforms. And it may well be that we could get another order of magnitude. I don't know, but you know, it seems like it should happen that we could get another order of magnitude in terms of the capital efficiency of deploying web services. And that's, and that's fundamentally disruptive because it means that you don't need much capital to go out and take a shot at you know, taking down one of these large institutions. The other thing um, that the internet does is it, it eliminates transaction costs. Initially, it lowers them, but I think ultimately it eliminates them. 
And you can see that in lots of marketplaces. You can see that in, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a portfolio company called Etsy, which uh, if you want to think about it, is taking craft fairs and putting them up on the internet. And uh, the cost of, for somebody who's a, who's a, who makes arts and crafts for a living to do business on Etsy is much less than um, it is for them to pack up their car and drive to a, cafe, a, a craft fair and set up a booth and, and all the costs associated with that. And, and so ultimately, I mean, Etsy takes a 3.5% um, fee on the transaction. Um, that's a lot lower than what, you know, a, if they were selling through retail would take. Um, and, 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 you know, who knows, 10 years from now, these marketplaces might exist without any transaction fees. And it may just simply be you know, marketing services without transaction fees. Uh, the other thing I think is really, really powerful about the internet is, you know, it's a, it's a two-way communication system, but we've had that for a long time, and that, frankly, is what, what, what the telephone has done. But it's a one-to-many system. And where I see that uh, every day is on my blog. So I get about five to 10,000 people a day who come read my blog. Works out to be about 150,000 people a month. Um, but on top of that, you know, I constantly am getting these discussions going on where uh, this is uh, a post I wrote uh, a couple weeks ago. Got 247 comments. So uh, Azim, who left this comment, uh, he, he left it for me, in theory, but 5,000, well, probably not 5,000, but certainly a couple thousand people saw that comment, and many of them replied. So it's more than just one-to-one, -one, it's one-to-many, and, and we, we get these massive kinds of amplifications of discussions that can go on on the internet, and, and the fact that they're public uh, from the start is also quite fundamental and important. So Josh Koppelman, who I'm sure some of you know and, and probably more of you have heard of, uh, is a friend and a, another venture capitalist. And, and he wrote a great post um, talking about shrinking a market. And this is at the heart of disrupting industries is the willingness to, make, to, to take less than the existing player. And, and the way Josh said it, which I think was really great, is um, if you have a business that will take um, one that will allow you to take five dollars of revenue from a competitor for every dollar you earn, let's talk. So what, what he's basically saying is, we want to invest in businesses that are going to have a lot lower revenues. Now, if you, if you map that to the capital efficiency slide, it also implies that there's going to be a lot less expenses. And so one of the things that I feel uh, is happening in this disruptive um, uh, kind of activity is, we're going to get businesses that may be an order of magnitude smaller in terms of revenue, but they're going to maybe be multiple orders of magnitude smaller in terms of expenses and could be way more profitable. So the classic example of that is Craigslist, which you know, I think is doing more than $100 million in revenue a year now um, and probably keeps 80 or $90 million of that in terms of profit. If you look at the classified, the newspaper classified advertising business that it disrupted, that business was certainly more than a billion dollars in revenue, um, probably multiple billions of dollars in revenue. But in terms of the margins, the, you know, after, after all the costs are factored in, the margins of the newspaper classified uh, business may not have been much larger than the 80 or 90 million dollars of, of margin that, that Craigslist is taking. And so that's, when you talk about shrinking a market, it's shrinking it from a revenue perspective, but not necessarily from a profit perspective. This concept of sustainability was not in my original deck, and I added it. This is a uh, this is an image I got on Flickr of um, of a of a green housing project in the UK. Um, I forget what it's called now. I, I, I promised to remember the name of it so I could tell you, but it's it's escaping me right now. Um, but in any case. Um, the notion of sustainability is more than just green. You know, when I think about sustainability, I think about something that can go on forever. It doesn't need to eventually die. And so at the heart of disruption is disrupting things that are unsustainable and replacing them with things that are sustainable. And uh, I like to think about that in terms of revenue models 
in terms of um, economics of the business, in terms of social responsibility, in terms of giving more value back to the consumer, and all of those things, anything you can do to make a business more sustainable, to make it so that less people would want to disrupt it, uh, the better off you're going to be. This, this is, uh, these six words uh, are something that our, our firm put together uh, about a year and a half ago. And, um, and I've used this, these six words in a bunch of my talks. People seem to like them. Uh, and I think that these are things that we look for in web services. Uh, you can read them. I don't need to read them for you. Uh, it was suggested to me yesterday that instantaneous would be a good uh, addition to that list. And I thought about it. And I think that, that it, may, it may well be that we should have seven words to live by on the internet. But hopefully, as we go through the presentation, can come back to these words and, and make sure that these words, in fact, make sense for a lot of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, uh, industries and sectors that are likely to be um, uh, front and center in, in internet disruption. So the obvious question is, OK, well, what industries are next after media? If media, media is well on its way to being disrupted, what's next? Uh, what I like to think about is what businesses are end-to-end -end digital. So media, of course, is end-to-end -end digital, and content is created, it can be created in a digital format, can be consumed in a digital format, and can be delivered in a digital format. Never has to, never do the bits have to become atoms. So uh, any, any business that's end-to-end -end digital, I think, is a good candidate for disruption. And uh, the other thing that uh, I think is important to think about as, as you go through this is the role of government in this. Um, and can government help? And you know, I think the, uh, what's going on with open, the open spectrum debate, which I know Google has been front and center on, is a good example of this. Uh, to the extent that we can get uh, government help in opening up access to these markets for disruption, the better off we're going to be. Now, government hasn't really shown an interest in disrupting industries. And in fact, you know, many people believe that government is in the pocket of the entrenched uh, uh, industries and the companies in those industries. So government might be a hindrance, but it may also be a help. And, and it's important to think about that. So here's my list. Uh, consumer finance, that of course could be financed more broadly. But uh, for some reasons that I'll talk about, I think consumer finance is, is the most interesting place to really look. Education, energy, and then healthcare and government are two that I put there with question marks. Um, I think there's a lot of promise in healthcare and government, but there are also some questions and concerns. So in finance, uh, my, my belief is that money is just bits. Money is just information, and, um, and, and finance is end-to-end -end digital. And, we don't need to be carrying around cash uh, in, in the form of coins or paper, and I don't think that we will be in, in the not too distant future. Um, we have this concept inside our firm of the unbank. What would, we, we have not invested in this, we'd like to invest in this. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why it's not easy to invest in this, um, but the question is, what would a bank look like if you could just start from scratch and forget about the regulatory environment forget about everything else that we know about banking, and just create something that works for us. And uh, I just showed a screenshot here. We have a portfolio company called Wasabi, which has an iPhone app. And the idea that you know, your, your, your financial transactions are just with you all the time, and, and you make them, and you have a record of them. And, 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 and on top of that, uh, the phone itself is the, uh, is the payment mechanism. You know, that, that model. I think uh, is inevitable. It already exists in, in parts of the world like Asia, where um, the, the phone companies and the banks are, for one reason or another, organized to work together to make this happen. Um, you know, in, in here in the US and I think in Western Europe, um, it's taking longer for this to happen. But I think when it happens, it'll happen in a more profound way because it won't be kind of dictated by the government and these large monopolistic companies. Um, so, so this is no question this is going to happen. And, uh, and it's just a matter of time. Uh, we also have some other uh, things that we're interested in. We, uh, 
are invested in a company called Covester, which is creating a peer-produced um, mutual fund or hedge fund. And the way this works is that um, anybody who trades stocks, either for a living or for a hobby or whatever, can take uh, one or more of their trading accounts and connect it to Covester. Covester then calculates a, uh, verifies and calculates a track record um, and uh, substantiates the track record. And then uh, invest, uh, investors who want to participate in one or more of these uh, investors simply puts money into a Covester account, it's a managed account, you pay a 1% fee, and then you allocate your capital against these various uh, investors. And you can uh, move in and out of them in an hour, in a day, in a week, in a month. And all the Covester is doing, of course, is just mirroring the, tw the trades. Um, whether Covester will be successful or not, I don't know, but I do think that this democratizes a business that has been very uh, undemocratic uh, and uh, allows talented people to do what they do best, which is uh, make investments and not have to worry about raising capital, not have to worry about managing funds, not have to worry about reporting to their investors. They just trade stocks and Covester or somebody else takes care of the rest. We also have peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, although it's interesting to note that you know, Prosper is, is in a quiet period now because they've run into some, some problems with the regulators. And uh, my hope is that they'll come out of this period and they'll, they'll, they'll figure out how to get the SEC to be comfortable with the peer-to-peer -peer lending approach. Um, I think there's some other issues with Prosper as it exists today. I think the loss ratios are too high. There's not a real alignment of interest between the lenders and the borrowers. I think it's attracted a fairly um, you know, low uh, quality level among borrowers. And, and whether Prosper is going to get it right or somebody else is going to get it right, um, I think, for example, collateralized lending, lending against assets, cars, or homes, to me, may be a better way to do peer-to-peer -peer lending because there, the lender has, uh, has less risk than making a completely collateral-free loan. Um, but I do think that peer-to-peer -peer lending will evolve and it will happen. Virtual currencies, um, I think, are a, a big opportunity. Um, it's our, we're already seeing companies that are making money um, offering items um, for sale and, and allowing people to build up virtual currencies. And the question is, when do those virtual currencies start to become available as real currencies? And when can we actually start to use virtual currencies to buy and sell things? Um, in, our, in, our, in, in our everyday life. When, when does the virtual currencies um, become uh, as good as, as the dollar or, or you know, gold? And, uh, and probably take some time, but, but my guess is that we will start to see that. So moving on to education, we did an event uh, a couple months ago called Hacking Education. And uh, we got about 40 people together, people who were entrepreneurs in education, educators themselves, researchers, and, and had a day-long conversation about uh, how to hack education. And a bunch of in interesting insights came out of it to me. Um, one thing that I didn't truly appreciate is the power of the unschooling and homeschooling movement and the power of the web to really be um, a force behind that. People ask, how are you going to really disrupt uh, the education system? Um, that's so powerful and so entrenched. And I think that things like unschooling and homeschooling are a big part of it. As, as people can start to opt out of the education system and start to uh, allow their children to be educated in these non-traditional environments and get great outcomes, more and more people will do it. And that's an industry that I think is investable. And, at, and we can start to create products and services that this industry will consume and that eventually the traditional you know, institutional education system will have to start uh, availing themselves of. So I would not try to disrupt the education system head on, but find pockets of the education system which are investable today, and then build products and services that can migrate from there into a more traditional environment. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the open courseware movement. This is just a screenshot of some classes that you could get access to from MIT. More, more and more schools are doing this. This is, uh, I think, a very big trend. And uh, the question, of course, is how do, how do we start to, to, to aggregate up all this courseware and, and make it useful for people? Um, 
and, uh, and I think there's a lot of work left to be done, but the raw material is there, and I think uh, the, these big educational institutions are starting to see the value in this. Now, this is also happening in K through 12. Um, there are companies out there that are creating networks for teachers in the traditional uh, elementary and high school system to start sharing courseware and sharing class notes, and there's Better Lesson and, and a bunch of others that are doing this. And so I think we're starting to see the commoditization of the curriculum and the courseware, which you know, heretofore had been a big you know, revenue stream for people. That, I think, is going to get completely commoditized and that there's ultimately going to be very little value in publishing class notes and course notes. That's going to be available for free. Um, and that in the same way that that's sort of happened with blogging and other forms of media, and the value is going to be going into aggregating and surfacing the highest quality uh, uh, stuff. Uh, so um, I'm sure everybody knows who Seth Godin is. Seth is doing a thing right now called the alternate MB MBA. So instead of going and getting an MBA, you go hang out with Seth for six months every morning in his office, and at the end, he gives you an alt a diploma. He gives you the Seth Godin alternate MBA. It's not accredited. It's, it's, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it probably is going to look cool, whatever his diploma is going to look like. Um, I would happily honor the Seth Godin alternate MBA, and, and I think many other people would too. So the whole notion of accreditation and, and what is a diploma, um, I think, is going to change. And people are going to be able to get credit for uh, uh, taking different kinds of education than, um, than they have in the past. And the notion of a, an accredited diploma issuing institution will become less important. Another thing that uh, we see again and again and again is that uh, if you let the students teach, they get smarter. And so uh, one of the things that, that the internet can do is provide students with the ability to start teaching each other. There's a lot of this going on in language learning already, people teaching each other different languages over the internet. Um, I know, having done a fair amount of teaching, that uh, the process of going through uh, what I'm doing right now, standing up in front of a bunch of people, forces me to get deeper into what I'm going to talk about than I would have if I didn't do it. And so forcing students to, to start to get up and stand in front of people and start teaching or um, that, that is a way to get them up the learning curve more quickly than sticking them in the front of room and, and just listening to somebody. And then, of course, games is a huge thing. The U.S. military teaches language with video games. So when they st send troops to Iraq, they don't teach them the local languages in this kind of environment. They put them in front of a video game, and if they don't get the languages right, you know, they die in the game. Right. That, that's a very effective way to, to teach language. And I think that video games, uh, maybe more than anything else I've talked about, um, has, the, has the power to change education. I also think the web can be a textbook. My, 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 my friend Brad Feld um, uh, writes a blog called Feld Thoughts. He's a venture capitalist. And he, he's done a series on term sheets. Um, if you're interested in venture capital, I can't imagine why you would be, but if you're interested in venture capital and you're interested in how term sheets work, you go read the 30 or 40 posts on term sheets that are on Brad Feld's blog, and they're all tagged with the word term sheet, so it's, and he's got all his categories on one side, so you can just literally click on the term sheet tag, and they'll all be there. You will, it'll take you maybe two or three hours to read all that stuff, and probably you'll have a bunch of questions that'll come out of that. You go through that, you'll be an expert in term sheets, and you don't have to buy a textbook, it's free. The other thing that I think is uh, going on in education is that as we start to put more and more of our work and our lives on the web, the web has the power to become a transcript. Um, and your work, uh, it, it's a place for you to see people's work. I already today go to people's LinkedIn profile, Facebook profile, Twitter profile. I learn way more about them that's interesting to me and valuable as a potential investor or hire than I learn looking at a resume. And, uh, and I think if students build that up over time as they go through the K through 12 process and into, into college, that gives them the power uh, to control what their transcript looks like. And it no longer, you know, my daughter just applied to colleges and she had to get her school to send the transcript to the college she's applied. She doesn't own her transcript, the school owns her transcript. That should change and that will change. So on to energy. Um, 
you know, electrons are a little different than bits, but at the end of the day, I still think that this is an area that is largely end-to-end -end digital. And, uh, you know, where this is probably all going to start is with the smart grid. My friend Tom Evzelin, um, who's the uh, stimulus czar in the state of Vermont now, he's a former entrepreneur and um, writes a great blog, has written a lot about the, the smart grid. And we're starting to see things uh, coming into the market now. Uh, this is a company in Brooklyn called Energy Hub. They make a bunch of products and services for people who want to create uh, basically smart energy systems in the home, smart thermostats, um, products that, that plug into their meters, that report back um, on where, you know, when, when and how they're spending energy, allow you to program the home to turn stuff off, turn stuff down. Um, and uh, you know, there are many companies that do this, so not suggesting that Energy Hub is is unusual in any way, but they make some great products and services, and, and they're an example of how smart grid's gonna happen in the home, it's gonna happen at scale, and, and information is gonna be a key component uh, in the energy marketplace. Uh, I'm also quite fascinated with the idea of microgrids, where as we start to put things on our properties and in our homes that, that generate electricity, we can start to create microgrids, um, peer producing, you know, we create our own little mini energy utilities to compete with the big utilities. Um, you know, it seems kind of utopian, but, but I think that uh, it's already happening and, and, and will, will happen more and more. Uh, if this is the new gas station, I think there's going to be a lot of data that comes out of this kind of activity. And um, I think there's going to, in the same way that smart grids, that the energy hub stuff can do for the home, I think there's a lot of technology, information-based, internet-based technology that can leverage um, energy consumption out in, in, you know, in cars and other transportation uh, areas. And energy and carbon trading is, is obviously a big market today. Uh, if we get cap and trade, then I think we're going to start to see uh, lots of interesting things. had a conversation with a guy the other day who was looking to put together a basically like an affinity card program for green products. And if you know the carbon footprint of the products and services that you're buying, and you, you have a, a record of buying them, then you're establishing carbon credits, which then could be bought and sold in the market. So this whole area is, is really quite fascinating and an opportunity for lots of information technology and internet innovation. We have a company in our portfolio called Amy. It's A-M-E-E dot com. And they've built the largest uh, web-based database, all delivered via an API, of carbon uh, consumption data. And, and so if you want to build an application or service that, that figures out carbon consumption and energy consumption, you can build it on top of Amy uh, and uh, be in the market very quickly. So now we're going to move on to the two sectors, I think, that are a little bit more questionable, starting with healthcare. The biggest problem in my mind with healthcare is it's not end-to-end -end digital, and uh, the person in the middle is your doctor. And you know, I think that you know, we, I think everybody is more than happy to disrupt our local cable company or our local phone company or our local newspaper, um, but not everybody wants to disrupt our local doctor. And uh, particularly if you like your doctor, you know, they're they're going to be there, and uh, I think that that makes healthcare a much more complicated problem. But even so, uh, I think there's a bunch of opportunity in healthcare. Uh, prevention is you know, so much stronger. The, co the cost of preventing um, disease is so much less than the cost of remediating disease. Um, and of course, vaccines, which this is a picture of, is a classic example of that. But um, you know, it, everything about how we can live a healthier life is out there for the taking, and, and we can do a lot with information and internet technology and, and let the consumer take care of that. And we can do that without our doctor. Um, we have a portfolio company, Meetup, and this is just the number of um, autism meetups around the world. Currently, there's 170 of them with over 8,500 members. There's over 6,200 interested people in joining a meetup group that are places where there aren't meetup groups yet. And, uh, and this is just one disease. So, these are self-organizing support groups of people who have diseases or have loved ones with diseases. And that's an example of people sort of taking control away from the healthcare system and starting to do it themselves. 
And games can change behavior. This is Humana, um, a big uh, healthcare company, has been developing um, games, video games. And games can change behavior. We all know that. If we start to play games that matter to us uh, and, and our behavior is being driven by things we do that are either healthy or, or not healthy, um, that can have a powerful income, uh, impact on the health of our population, the cost of health care. And of course, um, digitizing medical records is maybe, you know, for many people, the big you know, gorilla here. Um, 81 billion a year, what Rand Corporation says the US can save if we digitize medical records. Uh, obviously, Google's doing stuff in this area. Lots of people are doing stuff in this area. Uh, it is a big problem. We're probably not investing in this area anytime soon just because the privacy issues and the security issues and the regulatory issues, there's so much going on here. But I sure hope someone gets this right. If someone gets this right, it's going to unleash so much creativity and so much innovation. Um, and I'd love to invest behind the person who gets this right. But I don't think I'm going to invest in getting it right. Um, and on to government. So we're seeing signs, right? So the Obama administration is pledged to open government. And they're, they're using tools like Facebook and Twitter and blogging and YouTube um, and trying to make government more transparent. Um, but I think that most of the innovation opening government is going to happen at the local level first and that the federal level is going to be uh, behind. Uh, my friend Steve left me a comment with some stuff at the federal level that he thought would be uh, a target for internet-based innovation, procurement, defense, entitlement programs, tax collection, elections, law enforcement. Um, I, I think all that's true, but I get more excited with stuff like C Click Fix. This is a service that was built in New York. Um, you report on an issue, you create a watch area, and, and you can quickly report. Uh, this is sort of 311. Now, um, there's some people here at Google that are working on this, and I had a quick little side conversation before we started about um, how I could help them uh, or if they could help me uh, help more communities uh, take advantage of this. But what I think, what I get really excited about here is that today the way citizens communicate with their government is through closed channels. And if we can open up these channels and make them available to the public channels that are available on the internet, um, more people can, can see this kind of uh, government in action and, and, and help government fix the problems that are the most important problems that get fixed. Uh, the, Washington, D.C. has done a lot with their Apps for Democracy. Um, in fact, the CIO of Washington, D.C. is now the CIO of, of, of the United States government, um, largely because of uh, services like this, um, inviting local developers to build apps to help, uh, help the, the District of Columbia. And now you know, we've got the person who kind of was behind all that sitting in the White House. So uh, that's it. Um, I don't know how long I took, um, but I was hoping to try to keep my, my comments um, to uh, about a half an hour and, and leave about a half an hour for questions. So what, what time is it? Oh, it's a, it, OK. So we have, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, so why don't I take some questions from, from the, the audience, and then we'll take some questions from uh, uh, the uh, the web. So um, one of the biggest arguments against this kind of movement is sort of the death of the expert argument. So like journalists or doctors kind of being pushed out of the way. And, you know, obviously there are good things about that, not so bad things. I'm wondering just what your thoughts were on, on that argument. Can you um, repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, when industries get disrupted, <laughs> uh, there's some bad things that happen along with a lot of good things that happen. One of the bad things that happens is that the, the real experts, the real professionals, um, see the value of their work um, eroded, and, and they lose their jobs and, and lose their ability to make a living. And so the, the place where that's most true is, or at least where people are most concerned, is in journalism. And um, I, I think the problem there is that um, journalists are not entrepreneurs, and they're not business people, and they don't want to start companies, and they don't want to have to worry about trying to earn their living on a day-to-day -day basis. They want to go work in some institution that pays them $90,000 a year, and they can just write, and they can travel, and they can go report, and, and they're taken care of. And I think that 
the, that the model that we're headed to, um, those people are gonna have to somehow reorganize into a new, new economic form of doing business that um, will you know, pay, I think society as a whole needs them and will value them and will be able to, uh, to come up with a mechanism to pay, pay them, but it's unlikely to be in the existing institutions and organizations that they're part of. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of short-term disruption and I think things could get worse before they get reorganized and become better. So I, I think the pro that problem is a short-term problem and not a long-term problem because I think society still does value the experts. Um, now, I think in medicine, it's a lot less likely to happen because of the relationship that patients have with their doctors. It's such a deeply personal relationship that, it's, that most patients are not gonna wanna see their doctor going out of business. Um, it gives the doctor the ability to hang on in terms of an economic model much more than you know, a writer at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Um. I, um, one quick question about in disrupting technologies. One of the barriers to disruption a lot of times is the clearing houses, be it credit agencies, um, um, rating agencies, or the agencies that um, you know, rate the universities in order to uh, accredit them. How is it that somebody can disrupt an industry that has that entrenched clearinghouse or work with them or around them in order to do that? So the question is, um, a lot of the power in the entrenched models are in the accreditation and ratings agencies that, that establish what's good. Do you have good credit or do you not have good credit? Is this university accredited or is it not? Um, and how do, you, how, do you beat those? how do you beat those? I think that what happens typically to those uh, institutions is they get discredited. Um, I think that we've seen it in the financial markets now. So you know, there were bonds out there that were double A rated that are gonna default, right? And when enough of that happens, people are gonna just stop trusting the rating agencies. I think that's already happening in the financial markets, less so with, with universities, um, still very much a desire to go to the universities that have the biggest brands and reputations. But the problem with the university system is that the cost of going to a university is rising much more quickly than the value of that university diploma. And so at some point, you know, the economics of that are just gonna bust. So I, I think that um, these are, will take time, will take, it, it sometimes will require some sort of a cataclysmic event where people just lose confidence in them. But I think those are unsustainable models that some small group of people are quote unquote experts and establish these, these rating systems, that makes no sense to me. I, and I think it, they, they won't last. So um, you talked about disruption of industries. I think a lot of low hanging fruit is either being addressed now or has been addressed. And the ones that you mentioned, um, you know, you were, you were very good about mentioning also that they also had lots of hurdles like regulatory hurdles. So you have huge risks involved with things like finance. Um, how do you encourage both from the entrepreneur side as well as the venture side to actually tackle those things? Do we insulate somehow the entrepreneurs so they can take bigger risks in those areas? You know, how do we get somebody like you on the board to start investing in something where you have already, you've already said, well, I'm not going to tackle that because that's too big of a hairy issue. I'm going to let somebody else deal with it. How do we move that, how do we move that stuff forward? Well, First of all, it's a great thing that there's, there are companies like Google out there who want to take on the open spectrum problem, or who want to take on the medical records problem. Um, I think government can do it too. My, my partner Albert um, feels that the medical records problem can be solved very simply with, with a regulatory pronouncement, which just simply says that every pa patient is entitled to a digital med medical record and that has some very lightweight requirements around it, and then just says, market, go figure it out, right? Um, so in, it, the government has a very important role to play. The problem is the government has a tendency to want to dictate the solution to the problem. They want to actually say, okay, this is what a medical record is going to be, and they create this very complicated protocol or whatever, and then it doesn't happen because it's too hard. Whereas if the government would just do some very lightweight kind of you know, mandates and then let the market kind of figure it out, that could happen. If, if, if those things started to happen, 
I think people in the venture industry would be very willing to get behind those movements. But I don't think that you know, we can afford, I don't know how much money Google has spent in Google Health to date, but you know, we, we couldn't afford to spend 50 or $100 million trying to go do something in, in, in online medical records. It's too, too, too much risk and, and too uh, unlikely of a, of a big payoff. Um, something else I wanted to say on that. Uh, oh, my partner Brad um, always talks about companies that start with a very small um, kind of thing and get into the market and then can grow from there. And there's a lot of good examples of that. That's what we like to finance. So, um, you know, in all of these areas, we look for um, entrepreneurs who, who are trying to solve a very small piece of the problem. But if they get that solved and, and, and kind of own that, then from there they could, they could tackle it. These are 10, 20, 30 year kind of problems that, that are not gonna get solved immediately. So anybody who comes to us and says, I'm gonna solve the whole thing in two years, probably isn't, isn't the kind of venture that we would fund. Should we take one from the, uh, or should we, what, how do you wanna decide? Yeah, it's up to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, the question here is, which of Google's emerging products do you think are most promising and which do you think Google should scuttle? Um, uh, <laughs> By the way, you have people working in both those, both those areas. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I'm going to, this is going to be me speaking very selfishly. Uh, I would like to see Google tackle some of these really big fundamental problems like open spectrum or open government or open health care because I think that it's unlikely that um, the venture industry and entrepreneurs can, can tackle those. And I, I see what Google did with its search and search advertising platform and just basically powered the whole industry, right? You think about the... Everybody talks about the amount of money that Google's making in, in the search uh, and search advertising business. What people don't talk about is the billions of dollars that other people are making in, in, in that industry because of that. So uh, I, would, I would, selfishly, I'd like to see Google build some other big platforms that are sort of game changing in some of these industries and not focus on so much on what I think are um, kind of derivative uh, products or me too kinds of things that are already out there that Google can do well and does do well but doesn't really change the game that much. So that's, that's my answer on that one. That's selfish, but that's my answer. Uh, so you said that the, the ability to create a startup, the cost of that's gone down by two orders of magnitude, um, yet the VC industry is still thinking about uh, marketing or around. So is there going to be a peer-to-peer -peer disruption I don't know that I want to fund a peer-to-peer -peer disruption to the VC industry, um, <laughs> but I would be happy to see it happen. Okay, so you know, if if the VC industry could get reconstructed in a way along the lines of a Prosper or a Covester, um, and if all of you could do a better job than I can of allocating capital to entrepreneurs, that's fine. I mean, I I don't I don't. I don't care to be, you know, self-preservational in that sense. Um, I, I would, I want to see, you know, entrepreneurship and and innovation get funded in the best way it possibly can. Um, I think some of the problems around that are um, that uh, the current regulatory regime, again, government rears its ugly head, uh, makes it such that you have to be a quote-unquote qualified investor to invest in startup companies. And qualified investors are basically rich people. And so um, if the smartest people are not rich, but are the best people at allocating capital, they can't currently uh, invest in venture deals because they're not qualified investors. I don't know how we're going to disrupt the venture industry. So I think we need to change the regulatory environment a little bit. And the other thing is that there's a, um, there's a problem with uh, managing the venture investment. So, so what I do, if you look at the amount of time I spend, I say I spend about 20% of my time or 30% of my time 
finding investments and 70 to 80 percent of my time managing the investments we make. So I could see how a peer model could be really great at picking the companies to get funded, but I'm not so sure how the peer model works in terms of managing the investments once they've been made. So I, look, I, I'd love to see it happen, but it, it has some challenges. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions. What are your thoughts of Clickable? What is their unique value position, position, uh, proposition and their likely exit strategy? So Clickable, um, some of you know, probably know, it's one of our portfolio companies. They make a dashboard that sits in front of um, AdWords and also a bunch of other keyword marketplaces, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, Soon, Facebook, MySpace. Um, and, and the value proposition is focused on the small keyword buyer. Uh, anybody who spends less than thirty or $40,000 a month on keywords is not going to get serviced by the traditional search agency because the economics aren't really there for the agency. If the agency is making 15 or 20 percent of the keyword buy, that account isn't going to be worth enough to the agency. So those people are stuck doing it themselves. They're figuring out AdWords. They're running stuff in spreadsheets. And Clickable is um, an automated system with a very kind of easy to understand dashboard that lets the small and medium sized keyword buyers run a campaign on just Google or Google and all the other keyword platforms and it automates the process and comes back and says, gee, you ought to get rid of these keywords, you ought to add these other keywords, you ought to change your copy, you ought to bid more for these keywords, you ought to bid less for these keywords. And it's an iterative adaptive process that's all generated by, you know, by a, you know, computers for the most part, not people. Um, so I think it's very exciting. Anything that can make um, keyword advertising easier for small businesses to do um, I think is great. It's great for Google and I think it's great for these other emerging keyword marketplaces. Um, in terms of who uh, would buy Clickable, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I haven't really thought much about that. You know, our goal is to try to get it to be you know, a 50 to 100 million dollar revenue company and then I think we'll figure out who buys it. But my guess is anybody who's in the, I mean, I think that you know, um, I believe that um, measurable, um, high ROI, performance-based advertising is the future of advertising. And I think that um, uh, small businesses um, have had a hard time taking advantage of that kind of advertising. And so I think that anybody who's in the advertising business in five or 10 years is going to be interested in, in a company like Clickable. Um, one more question. One more question. Anybody in the crowd? Here. All right, so we'll do one more from the screen. As a VC, what do you think of Google starting a venture capital arm? What are your thoughts on corporations having venture arms? When does it work and when doesn't it work? I, I'm, I, look, Google can do whatever they want to do. I don't think that uh, there's any real reason for Google to be in the venture capital business. Uh, I don't think that corporations make great uh, investors in startups. I think there's a... Um, uh, misalignment of interest. I mean, Google should be interested in owning and operating its businesses, not really being a minority investor. I don't know what, um, you know, Google buys 20% of one of our companies, that company gets sold, Google has a one-time gain of 50 or 100 million dollars, and so what? I don't know how that helps Google. So, um, I don't think that, you know, I've seen corporations come in and out of the venture capital business, I've seen very few corporations, with the exception of Intel, be committed to it for a 20-year period. It comes and goes. It's sort of the flavor of the month. Um, and uh, I, 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 think they could, I think Google could be spending their money on much better places than venture capital. Uh, so um, I, I don't think it's a particularly great use of their time, energy, and money, to be honest. All right. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Fred. I think everyone was very excited. So.